ourselves. So again, this is, um, I'm Cynthia Elliott, and I have been an educator for over 20 years. My background in my education itself is in child development and family studies. And then um, I have two kids, and one is a graduated Byron student, and she's in college now, and then the other is a freshman at Byron. Um, so I'm right there along with you on this parenting journey. So uh, Ryan, tell us a little bit about where you come from. So I'm Ryan Laney. I'm the intervention counselor at Byron Nelson High School. I'm a licensed therapist. I, I've been in education. This is my third year in education. I came from uh, the criminal court system where I used to do psych evaluations uh, for the courts. Um, I, I, Cynthia, I don't know if you know this, but I'm responsible for five kids right now, but I have one in the oven, so I'm responsible for six kids. Oh, congratulations. Yeah. So you have a 19-year-old, a 16-year-old, a 10-year-old, uh, almost seven-year-old, an almost six-year-old, and then, you know, the one in the oven, so. Oh, well, okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm busy. Well, congratulations. We're very happy Thank for you. you. That gives you a wealth of knowledge just about every childhood educational uh, time frame there. So that's wonderful. Well, as we just, just go through some of the social emotional um, health information today, I just thought it was important to just set a, some expectations up. So what we'll, we'll definitely explore social emotional health in general. And then we are going to um, describe the district's framework for the social emotional learning that happens on campuses. And then we'll definitely bring up some strategies that would help you and your, your kiddos with their own social emotional health. So I'd really love for you, like my goal, even just as a parent, and when I go to um, participate in webinars, I love to walk away with actually some affirmation of like, oh, whoosh, okay, this hard parenting stuff, I'm actually doing some really positive things. So really some of the things we talk about tonight should affirm a lot of the great parenting choices you're making. But then I'd also love it if we walk away with just two or three things that you're like, you know what, I, that challenged me and I can see where I need to grow in that as a parent to help my kiddo. Um, and so, yeah, so that's kind of where we're going at and our goals for tonight. Um, so we're going to start just in general with the definition of social emotional learning, particularly, I'd guess, say in the educational field. But it's the process that children and adults use to acquire and effectively apply the knowledge, attitudes, and skills necessary to understand and manage emotions big one, set and achieve positive goals, feel and show empathy for others, establish and maintain positive relationships, and make responsible decisions. So that is definitely a mouthful and kind of vague, but we're going to really pick apart each of those as we go along. So we're going to um, definitely cover all that. So, but tell me first, and Ryan, you can share with us, and then parents, this is where we'd also love you to jump in, is tell us why you feel like in the last two to five years, really, there's been such a big emphasis on social emotional health in just society in general, like what's happened, where are we at, what are we looking for as we um, try to dive deep in this? Like, how, how do we get here? Well, I know from a, from a therapy perspective, especially working with kids, is that I, our society has changed a lot since some of us older people were, were kids. You know, we had, there's more organization, more people involved in day-to-day, -day, like in-person activities. And just for, with the invention of the iPhone and things like that, mm -hmm. uh, kids rely on that so much more than what they used to. So they don't have as many natural, uh, natural ways on a day-to-day -day basis to develop their social emotional learning. So in the education system, we've really decided to put a focus on it because those are skills that we noticed that kids were missing, skills that were important in the workplace that they just, there were gaps that were there. So I know, especially for NISD the last three years, that's been really a big point of emphasis for us, but not just with the kids, but also teaching staff members about SEL 
because the main thing when it comes to social emotional learning is that kids kids are going to model the adults i think one of my favorite lines is that uh what how does it how exactly does it go you know ki kids are known for not listening to adults but they've never failed to uh imitate adults so as long as you know these are skills we have to have as well in order to show kids the right way to do things. Abs yep, absolutely. Uh, I noticed for myself and just observing students, you know, being a teacher for 20 plus years is how drastically um, the number of kiddos coming into the counseling department has been and just it just seems like over the years kids are struggling. So we need to just definitely be more proactive in um, in teaching them, you know, this right along partnering with the parents, definitely knowing that the parent and the family is the basic unit of society and that that's where the main learning is, but we want to partner with them and be a positive part of that growth. Does a parent or anybody participating have any thoughts on why you feel it's important to cover this? Okie doke. Okay, well just feel free to unmute yourself as we go. So as we uh, start getting into the nitty gritties of it all, we definitely want to just pause to say, okay, so well, how does a child learn social emotional skills? And so, Ryan, you were right on target as far as like at the top of the pyramid here, the top of this model of learning is it is the family being the primary role for kids. And so that should be both encouraging and then a little daunting, right? Uh, but their peer, just because it's a huge responsibility, their peer group also is, um, you know, a huge part of what teaches them. Um, and then, so that is our responsibility to try. Especially, especially as they get older, right? Yeah, like absolutely. For sure. And then the schools do. We, we, we recognize we're influential. So that's why we jumped on board with that. And then if there's a religious affiliation in a home that that generally will contribute to social emotional and then just the community feel in general can definitely promote um, whether a child builds their social emotional skills or not. So we just want to throw that out there just again affirming the importance of the family and yet also where the school might might fit in on that. Um, so the social emotional learning framework, we're going to pause and take just a minute for Ryan to explain just what is going on in our schools with this framework. So there's, there's basically an organization, it's called CASEL, but it, it's an organization designed to help schools throughout the nation um, work on social emotional learning. So they've created the framework. And, and what we did at Northwest ISD was we took that framework uh, we spent a lot of time coming up with this pretty picture with the rose petals and everything. Uh, and we have plastered it all over every school. Uh, and every, every month, at least once a month, we have a specific lesson devoted to each one of the petals. And, you know, what our vision was, was to create an intentional, nurturing, and caring culture from, you know, starting at elementary school all the way up throughout high school um, to help develop social emotional learning in, in our students. And, and, you know, it's something that we're not, it's something that's still developing and it's something that every year we, we pick a new focus. Um, we really try to focus really hard and, and be, be that organization that can really help the students outside of the home, so. Yeah, and I love, because I know you were on that committee though, Ryan, so I love though how you, just as a family, person and focusing on serving families of always honoring about how the importance of the family and the community and then um, making it so intentional that everyone in our district, I know even the, um, ad the administration in their meetings get social emotional learning. So we're right on board with everything going on in the district. So that's going to look different for sure. I know at the elementary levels, they'll have the counselor talks and different things that, you know, kindness week and different things to really promote all this. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So parents, if you in the chat room have any um, comments or want to tell us how you've seen this on your campus, that would be, you know, really 
um, really fabulous. And Ryan, I'll let you keep up with that chat room, please. All right. Yeah. Okay, so one thing that when we look at that, that flower and all those things is we're gonna go over each one of those petals. But one thing I want you to know we're not possibly gonna be able to do is put a strategy for each bullet point in 45 minutes to, you know, we wanna keep this definitely less than an hour. So we <laughs> um, are going to definitely talk about a strategy for each area, but not necessarily each bullet point. But that doesn't mean we don't ask that you, you know, ask us questions on, you know, things particularly that might be a speci specific interest to you regarding your child. So that is what, um, how we're going to go about this and look at each petal and just try to brainstorm, particularly because parents, you're the expert of your child. So as I look at this, I think of already at one of my children, I'm, I'm in my mind, I'm thinking of what they have, um, particularly just because of their temperament, their strengths versus something we might need to work on. So when it comes to self-awareness, you know, it really is a long process for each of these petals. Like a lot of times, even adults, we might, I don't care if you're 30, 40, 50, whatever, we're always working on these. And so I want us to just think of these sweet children who are growing and have so much going on in their lives that they're rapidly growing on that, um, in these and trying to learn this and absorb all this. And so um, we, I just think that's important for us to recognize that we need to have a lot of grace on them in learning this and not expect them to have the adult behavior when they're just a kid trying to figure this all out. So when we think of a child being able to accurately recognize their emotions and think through their thoughts and values um, and how they might influence their behavior, you know, this is the ability to accurately assess their strengths and then their limitations without going, being like down on themselves. We can all be like, yeah, I'm not good at that and be okay with that. Um, and just a well-grounded sense of confidence, optimism and developing a growth mindset. So here are the bullet points that we would say, you know, these are areas that we wanna encourage our kids to grow in. So when I look at this, like identifying emotions, again, it's gonna really depend on your child, their temperament, um, kind of their environment, but also their, just their age. So I would encourage parents to, um, one, when they're younger, really labeling emotions. And that's one huge thing. And as they grow older, having them label them and let, let them know that, that emotions are okay, just normalize those feelings. It's what we do with the feelings that would be where we need to start modeling and teaching them. So um, I, I think it's important that we create a safe place for them to express their emotions but in acceptable ways. So it's okay that you're angry. Um, and if they, you know, well, you shouldn't be angry about that. Well, there's a reason they're angry about that. But I think we're easily go to where we might be dismissive of their emotions and yet helping them see that, you know, those emotions are there for a reason. We don't want to live life in our emotions because that's exhausting, but we definitely want to see what role they play in our life and that they're an important part of um, the human process and human experience. And so, uh, but as we go down, you know, we want to definitely start understanding how they affect us and how we can use them in a positive light and, you know, construction um, with, in a, you know, a good way. Um, Mr. Or Ryan, tell me something you think about when you think of self-awareness. Well, I, there's a couple of things that I do um, in the counseling office when it comes to that. And so like teaching kids the I statements. So being able, that helps them identify their feelings. So, you know, just being able to say, I feel, you know, when, when I get a bad grade on my test, I feel embarrassed or I feel not smart or, or whatever, helping them really identify those emotions through simple statements. There's uh, sometimes we use bug and wish statements for some of the younger kids, just saying so. It, it bugs me when my mom tells me to go to bed at eight o'clock. I wish I could stay up to nine o'clock. 
while they're not going to be able to stay up till nine o'clock, at least they're able to communicate it. And it gives them, a, it helps them understand their own feelings a little bit better. Mm -hmm. uh, now, I know with the older kids, one of my favorite things to do, it's actually a really hard activity, but I, I give them a sheet of paper with numbers one through 50 on it. And so it's really good for kids who are dealing with depressive symptoms or, or low self-esteem because they don't have a lot of awareness of what's really going on. They only identify with the negative emotions and the negative self-thought. And so I'll have them write out 50 good qualities that they have about themselves. Or, and, and so that's what I tell them at, at first. Some kids might only be able to list five or 10, but whenever they get to a point where they can't really come up with anything else on their own, I'll say, okay, now if I asked your mom what some of your good qualities are, what would they say? And then that normally gives them another five to 10. And then what would your dad? What about your grandmother? What about your coach? What about your teacher? And by the time we go through all these people in their lives, you know, they have 50 really good qualities and that helps them see themselves how other people do and helps them focus on the positive. I, that simple task I've seen, I mean, help countless kids. It's, it's really, it's a really good way to get them to, to start accurately recognizing who they are, their emotions, things like that. I could see where that is so powerful. And as an adult, it makes me think of when I'm in an interview and they ask me, you know, what are your strengths? And yeah, you know, I should hopefully have prepared for that interview and kind of be ready for that. But th it always hits you like, oh, oh gosh, you know, like for some reason, we're not always given permission to mm -hmm positively of ourselves which is is silly I mean we don't of course want to come off as high and mighty and, and like arrogant but it's okay to think highly of ourselves and know our strengths mm -hmm. um and you know of course they're going to follow that with well what are your areas you need to work on right and that's why it's part of here of you know recognizing our strengths and our limitations and helping mm -hmm. our kids do that and construct it in a way that we want it's okay that they have those limitations and I always think right. Ages of where they're at, so that what we're talking to them about is you know age appropriate and not putting too much pressure on them. Um, and so, because that with doing that, I believe it is going to build their self confidence, right? I'm guessing, Ryan, you've seen that a lot in working with those kids. Is that what you would say? Is they leave feeling like you know heads a little tall? Oh, I, I, I mean, with that one um, exercise. Like I've seen kids go from, you know, kind of Eeyore mopey all the time to it just completely changes who they are because they start to give themselves some, some worth in their own eyes, which is, I mean, that's really, that's really important for everybody. So, yeah, thank you. And so if I'm at home with toddlers, I am speaking those things into them. And, you know, what they are and then getting them to start saying, I'm so strong. And kids do that naturally at that age. I love how they just think the world is so great, you know, mm -hmm. at that preschool mm -hmm. age. And so we just need to keep somehow uh, encouraging them to have those positive thoughts and know their strengths for sure, which builds their self-confidence. And then that self-efficacy is that, hey, I can do it attitude. So yeah, when you when you have that self-confidence, it's it's much easier to feel like you're able to you know, accomplish whatever you set your mind to. Right. And so parents, as you're listening to all this, really, you have to think of your child's interests because they can build so much self-confidence in growing in what they love. So it could be academic. It could be musical. It could be sports related. It could be science related. I mean, just so many things that they could explore and that they're good at because they have the interest or they can get better at because they're willing to put in the work because their interest is there. And so those are great ways to build a kiddo's um, self-confidence and feeling of success as they see themselves grow and pushing them just enough to where it's a realistic push. I feel success. I feel more of a I can do it attitude for sure. But then I love the last one on here, Ryan, just because it's, you know, appreciating one's uniqueness and celebrating that. And oh my goodness, don't we need that right in our world? Mm -hmm. And so. Um, well, and I think for kids, like, you know, kids don't, it's hard for kids, a lot of kids to think of themselves as unique because a lot of times unique is bad. They want to kind of fit into the crowd. 
And so to understand that, like what makes them special is part, part of that. So a part, it, part of what makes them special is not being like everybody else. Absolutely. And to celebrate those things. So, all right, hopefully we're giving you a couple challenging things to think about and also celebrate some of the, where you know your child is at in this, in this um, pedal. We're going to move on to social awareness. Um, so we want them to gain the ability to take the perspective of and, em and empathize with others, including those from diverse backgrounds and cultures. It's the ability to understand um, social and ethical norms for behavior and to recognize family, school, and community resources and support. And again, I just kind of think of all that and I'm like, whoo, this is a lot to look at, but let's try to pinpoint, you know, some general things that might apply for all ages. So I think when you look at all these tasks on the um, bullet list, you know, a lot of that is basically skills they would have that would make them a good friend. So from, that's my big strategy tip, like, and I know that seems pretty basic, but do things that will teach skills that lead to friendships, because we're definitely built in our humanness to want social connection. And like you said before, that's getting harder and harder as we think we're connected on this phone, our kiddos do. And it's really just, it's, it's not, it's kind of fake. So we're not 100% real like in when it's in person. Um, so even in the littlest of ages and on up, I was just modeling these things like sharing, giving compliments to people and taking turns. I think a family game night or just, you know, just again, ways you can have them practice, practice, because we know as they practice these skills, that's what's going to make it their muscle memory, where it's just a part of who they are. It might not be even part of their temperament because that's more inborn, but their personality is to derive from a lot of their social environment. So practice, practice helping others, find ways as a family to help others and even reaching out across the lines of whatever that would look like of different neighborhoods and um, to even hit on some of the other parts of just appreciating diversity. And then the um, cooperative play and giving those opportunities. So I wanna take a moment to just shout out something that the district offers starting in kindergarten and that's destination imagination. This opportunity um, is totally voluntary. It's not assigned by a teacher. A kiddo has to say, hey, I wanna participate. It's parent-led, meaning the parent volunteers generally are the ones who are the coaches for those teams. But if you wanna look more into that, that has been one of the most exceptional tools that I, I made sure, again, I was real intentional with my kids. I'm like, they need to do that because talk about learning how to work with someone. One of the challenges in that is they get an instant challenge and as a group of four to, I don't know, maybe four or five kiddos, they have to figure out this problem in, in like five minutes. And so you- and do it together as a team. Yes, and, mm -hmm. and you have to then come up with that solution for whatever they presented for you. So you don't have time to bicker and go through. I mean, you just have to learn and, and they practice those at their team meetings. And it just so, yeah, big shout out for Destination Imagination. It is awesome. Part of it, for sure. It's at the all levels. Um, and I was a coach, you know, they need more coaches and I, I just might, I'll do it. Okay. And just really encourage that participation. So just one little thing, but it, it covers all of this plus so, so much more of really working at um, being able to be with people. What what tip do you have, Ryan, on just building kiddos social emotional or social awareness? Well, I, I think one of the things that I try to do with my own kids quite a bit, and it annoys the heck out of them, but whenever we're like reading a book or even watching a movie, I, I really like, I will pause and ask them what they think one of the characters was thinking at the time they made a decision or like, when they did something, I just kind of ask them for, for their opinion. And then based on what my kid says, I'll give them what I interpreted the action or whatever they said, or whatever the character did, I'll give them my interpretation. And then a lot of times I'll create some dialogues. Sometimes the kids will just be like, dude, dad, stop. Um, 
but it, it helps them, it, it allows me to guide them in interpreting social cues and, and uh, you know, just all the different other social awareness pieces. But I, I think when I, mo almost all the, the pedals that we're gonna go over tonight um, really comes down to modeling, like being a good model. If you don't want your kid to be rude to waiters, then you can't be rude to waiters. You know, you have to set the pace because they are always watching you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Brian, I did see someone ask about destination imagination in the comments. So the season for that is over in this school year. They generally start form formulating their teams, I believe in either November or December, and they start practicing in January, February, and then the competition is in March. So, um, but that's okay. You can definitely reach out to your um, campus counselors and they can let you know who on that campus is in charge of destination imagination. And, and you can just start planning for next year. They have a great, it's an international organization. You can also just look Google destination imagination to learn more and that'll just get you more excited even to make sure your kiddo participates next year. We have like 20 some kit uh, groups moving on to the state competition from our district so pretty impressive yeah um so parents again just join pop in when you want just unmute yourself and either give us a comment because we value your experience or ask a question but to keep our time frame going we're gonna we're gonna move to this next um this next area all right responsible decision making uh, so constructive choices, right? Making constructive choices about their personal behavior and their social interactions based on their ethical standards or moral decisions. Of course, also we want them to think about their safety concern and social, what are the social norms? Having them build the ability to have the realistic evaluation of consequences of various actions and a consideration of the well-being of themselves and also others. So Ryan, I'll let you start on this one. Tell me what you feel when you look at those bullets. Um, what what can we do to encourage our kids? Well, you know, with with kids of all ages, you know, they can be impulsive, right? So uh, what we try to do is teach them, kind of use, especially the younger kids, do like a traffic light type situation where you teach them to think of a traffic light. Like before you do any anything, stop, think about it, think calmly about it, be calm uh, on the, the red light. On the yellow light, you think of whatever the problem, you state what the problem is, you come up with as many possible solutions as you can, uh, you evaluate those solutions, then you come up with a plan, and then the green light means, okay, if you've done all that, you're ready to go, you're ready to make a decision. Um, as kids get older, I think it's really important that parents, uh, you know, as parents, sometimes we want to make the decisions for our kids all the time, and that way all the best stuff happens to them, right? But sometimes kids need to have that experience of making the wrong decision, suffering the consequences of the, the natural consequences of it. So th thinking of a high school student like, um, you know, staying up late the night before a test and not st you know playing Fortnite instead of studying um when they go take the test they're not going to do so well they're going to fail it they're going to have to retake it the grade's not going to be good and just you know all the consequences that come with those decisions they need to see the negative outcome of non-responsible decisions sometimes and as parents sometimes we have to let them do that because uh, that's only that's that's going to be the best way that they learn so, and also too, I go back to modeling, like if you want your kids to make responsible decisions, you have to make responsible decisions in front of them because they're, they're always watching. And fess up when we don't, because we're yes. definitely, like I said, we're still just 
working and growing and, and life as an adult, right? The whole, I don't want an adult anymore that you hear people say, yeah. it, is, it is, we don't always do it right. And just make, letting them know we don't do it right all the time either. And all work we can do is build as many skills as possible to try to create the best outcome as possible. And, and um, I, I'll say one of the things I do most when I'm meeting with students, um, especially as they're a little older, um, like juniors and, and seniors, I can't tell you how many times they come into my office and they're just kind of floundering around, like their grades aren't that good. Uh, they're not doing any, they're, they're really just not doing, they're skipping class, they're not doing much. And I'll, the first thing I'll ask them is, okay, what is your goal? What's your goal in a month? What's your goal in a year? What's your goal you know, when you're 25? And they, none of the kids who aren't doing that great in school, none of them have a goal. So if you can really help your kids set small goals and long-term goals, it makes it so much easier for them to make good decisions. Uh, it almost, it allows them to kind of go on autopilot because if you want to be a doctor, if their goal is to be a doctor, then they're naturally going to start making doctorish decisions, like the path to lead to a doctor. But if there is no goal, they have no direction. So they just kind of stay in the same place. So help yeah. them with that goal yeah. is so important. It is. And even visualizing that goal for them. Like you said, if I want to, you know, if they love to run and they want to be on the cross country, cross country team or something when they get in high school of just putting a picture of one of the, you know, good runner or just those things actually have lots of mind games going on with that, but it works. It works that when you put that picture up of, hey, that's the goal I want to reach. Um, I want to camp just a second on the reflecting because I'm concerned about that. Because again, if we go back to our technology absorbed culture we, we're kind of living in right now, we're, when do we ever turn things off so we can reflect and just think and even be bored, right? And I know there's so many good parents up there that are really are watching their kids and their, temp, their technology time and all, and I applaud them for that. So that would be something I love that this framework puts reflecting because we really need to, I hate to say be bored, but we need that downtime and- No, yeah, you so right. You were so right. I, when the snowpocalypse happened the other week, lost power, lost internet connection, uh, power came back on, but no internet or TV. I didn't know what to do with myself. I, I had like an hour of just sitting there not doing anything. So, and I remember what it was like had not, like when I grew up, I had four channels on the TV. We didn't even have cable. So I had a lot of time to sit around and do nothing. Yeah, so I think well, one of the resources I've been really looking at, just again, going to basics, like getting in nature. Um, you don't even have to go on vacation. We have a little nature park about a few blocks away. Just go, go out there, get out of the house, do those things. Um, the other thing with goal setting, I love how you, you know, talked about how important that is. And I also think it's important to give them the skill of plan B, um, of just goals don't always work out you know, mm -hmm. adjusting and readjusting and what it means to have a plan B. Yeah, and to be resilient because yeah. some of your plans, you're going to fail at some of your plans and that's okay. Failure is a part of it. There's no one who's been successful at absolutely everything they've done. There's no absolutely. one. So it's absolutely. It's learning from those failures and that way we're, we're constantly growing. Mm -hmm, for sure. All right. Well, I just threw a few of these great questions up for you to think if you're really good at asking these things, I think one of the best ways we can have our kids become great problem solvers or is, I mean, make them think. And so we need to listen more. And I, I'm so quick to either Oh, well, did you think of this? Did you think of this? Or, well, what, what was your side on it? Or what, you know, instead of just going, hey, well, what was the problem? Tell me more about that. And then, oh, thank you for sharing that. What do you think you should do now? And these kids, I'm telling you, these youngest kiddos, they are so creative and smart and they really have to time solve it for themselves. And then when they do come up, okay, here's what I think I should do. You can say, well, what would that look like? to go and do that? You know, what does it look like to go and to apologize to the friend that you weren't nice to today and you're sad or, you know, and then how did that work out for you later? Go loop back around. And so I just think it's real important that we ask more questions um, and, 
and help them process through all of what's going on in their brains. And it'll, yeah. It'll, yeah. The, the mind has this amazing, like, don't, this better not leave this Zoom, but like therapy is, therapists are, are the, I can't tell you how many times people have been like, oh, you helped me so much, blah, 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 blah. I didn't do anything. Like literally ask some questions. They started talking and our minds have this amazing way of, you know, when you have a thought in your head, it kind of bounces around. And then you have a bunch of thoughts. They're all bouncing. You can't focus on anything. But when someone asks you a question, that process of it going from your brain out your mouth, it, it solves itself and it makes people feel better. So as a parent, if you're just by listening to your kids, you're going to help them process and solve so many problems and cut off so many issues before they ever begin just because you asked them, hey, what's going on? Tell me about it. And just getting them to talk. And I know that's really hard. Every, every day when I pick up my kids, it's, how was your day? I get the same. They're all boys, so it's good. It doesn't matter what happened. They could have lost an arm. Their day was good. So it's then, right. <laughs> well, and I love that because then it goes back to one of the other pedals is we're working on this. They're going to feel so good about figuring out it's not as much anymore of, oh, my mom told me or my dad told me or my aunt or whoever, my grandma. I figured that out and how good mm -hmm. that feels. Mm -hmm. Sure mm -hmm. to do that. All right. Well, let's move to the next one here of self-management. Oh, man, one of the harder ones, that's for sure for me at least, but it's the, you know, the ability to successfully regulate one's emotions, all about regulation in this, the thoughts and behaviors in different situations. And so we want to build their managing stress, controlling impulses and motivating oneself. I would really just interject here that a child's temperament is gonna greatly influence where they're at in this. Other conditions like, you know, AD, HD, ADD, all of those things are going to be a huge, have huge implications on how you parent through this pedal. So, um, but, but also too, if you're able to, to teach your kids self-management, it will, it will help the kids that have ADHD or, uh, you know, just emotional regulation issues. It really helps them on their day to day. So this is a really important one. Yeah, it really is. So uh, I love just was replying to one of the chat work rooms about just being more specific about what you ask your kiddos about their day and something that made you smile or something that made you, you know, I love that. Thank you for sharing. Um, okay, so when you look at this, I think um, we can't develop self-control until we've been given control. And that's really challenged me as a parent because not just the decision making process and problem solving, but I, you know, I think it's an important thing as they age. If I've always said, if you can do it, you should be doing it. And, and my kids didn't always like that. You know, if you can make your lunch, you should make your lunch. Now I might check that lunch to make sure it's not all just, you know, cookies and chips, you know, I'm going to check that lunch, but she should make her lunch. Um, there's lots of great resources out there about, uh, you know, appropriate chores and tasks for different ages. So we won't spend a lot of time on that. But if you struggle with knowing kind of what a certain age can do, you can look at those resources. Um, but that's a great motto, just kind of a, hey, if you can, you should. So my kids in middle school, you, I can teach you how to, to run a washing machine. I haven't touched their laundry since, except for an occasional, I'm just being a real sweet mom and they're in a pinch. But for the, cause I still wanna demonstrate kindness, but for the most part, that's their responsibility. So I love that thought of, you know, kids needing chores and then kids needing the power to make some choices, which will then give them the opportunity to fail, but then also the opportunity to succeed. And so, and all that goes back to building their self-control, their self-motivation, their desire to develop the self-discipline to meet, again, the goals. You see how all of this just totally bleeds over into each other, for sure. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, it really does. It, it really meshes together. Yeah, they sure do. They're all interrelated, for sure. 
Um, and then just the organizational skills. And that just cracks me up because as a, you know, mom with a ninth grader, you know, although it's better than it was in middle school, we still, you know, um, it's just an ongoing thing. And then I have to look at myself and look at all my clutter, you know, so it's just, again, temperament, livable, also just, hey, this is life. But we need basic organizational skills to get through life without being frazzled all the time. Um, yeah, and then being able to accept responsibility, um, which means, you know, what do you think the key? How do we teach kids to accept responsibility? I, I can tell you one thing that I do a lot as a parent is, you know, yeah, I think as a parent, it's really hard to when you make a mistake or you give the wrong answer or you do something that you shouldn't do, it's really hard to be like, yeah, dad screwed up. I did this. I should have done that. I, you know, I yelled and I shouldn't have yelled. Um, but accepting responsibility when you make a mistake, this is another one where modeling is so huge. Um, as a parent, like it's really important to keep promises to kids because that demonstrates to them it's really hard to be self-disciplined when you can't trust the the structure behind life, right? So like, if you can't believe that everything your parent tells you, it's hard to be self-disciplined or be self-motivated when you don't know what they, if what they say is consistent. Um, so that, that's a big one. And as a parent, it's also really important to set an environment where, you know, self-discipline, self-control, is consistently rewarded. It is definitely one of those things where when you recognize it, letting them know that you noticed it and that they're doing a good job, that goes a, a long way in teaching long standing self control, self discipline, self management. Yeah, I, and I would go, I would challenge us all that if, if we want them to accept responsibility, that we need to normalize failure and normalize the mistakes that people make and that it's a that then that gives them permission to admit their mistakes instead of like ah you know my parents are going to be so so upset at me well we might be disappointed and that's okay to say i'm disappointing you betty particularly when we know that they just really went against something that they knew but, but versus hey you're you're a five-year-old you spilled your milk okay <laughs> you know who's i mean just we need and then oh mom sorry you know just it starts so young and so much of this but giving them permission and then in when you think of the punishments and consequences i know i'm a lot more lenient it looks different let me say that it looks different in punishments or consequences when they accept responsibility versus when i you know i'm approaching them and they've learned that super quick so they learned you know i better probably tell her about that bad grade before she looks at my report card well and you know when kids are younger it, it's also really important to discuss with them before anything ever comes up different consequences not ne not necessarily like family consequences but but uh -huh. also school consequences world consequences just that way they have a base knowledge. So then when they're, you know, making these decisions in their head that they know what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I think kids do things and they just don't even think of what the consequences are because no one's ever talked to them about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, so, and just so going back, pulling back again, looking at this big picture, I'm hoping that my thought is it's a time to for us to do some reflection on our parenting on our kiddos where they're at in life and knowing and acknowledging the again some of the things we can be so proud of of where they're at but then also something that we might need to organize and help and kind of push them along on and so just like for example say time management again that would be something that uh, is such a quality skill because we know in, in life that one reduces stress and just um, can, you know, you'll be more efficient, just all these benefits to having good time management. Um, but then that could start young with setting routines, making that, you know, making charts, um, having if then statements, you know, or when then, when you pick up that, you can then go have that, you know, so um, there's a lot of techniques to for all of these that, you know, just explore, choose one thing, start implementing it, and you're going to find that, you know, your child is already growing in these things. So, okay, we are 
quickly running out of time and one person particularly in the chat box mentioned their kiddos struggle with having a social group so this is i'm hoping they're still on here and that they can see that we're going to really address that right now because that's that is big 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 so when we think of social emotional health we can't help but think of relationship skills and establishing those relationships and maintaining a healthy relationship and finding that reward you get from good relationships. Um, and But those take a lot of skills, like communication skills, listening skills, being able to cooperate with each other, um, resisting social peer pressure or inappropriate peer pressure, because there could be positive peer pressure, um, and then negotiation skills, and then seeking help. So when we look at this bullet list, parents i i you know all these are so powerful but one i think we need to remember and particularly on this pedal i would say it's one of the hardest ones relationships because you're working with other humans and we are all working on just you know I mean, we just it's tough let's just <laughs> acknowledge that so i think it's important to have grace and but to challenge our kids to work put the work in to have those friendships, but then also normalize the cycle of friendships. I know my kiddos would be crushed when they're fifth grade, you know, when they move from fifth to that sixth, seventh, eighth, and their bestie went on to, you know, like someone who was in volleyball instead of, you know, and just their changes, their interests changed. It was a natural thing in my eyes, but to her, it was crushing. So normalizing what friendships look like, but then encouraging them to put the hard work into maintaining, you know, forgiving, working through um, situations so that we do build, build those skills. So Ryan, tell me something. I know you, gosh, probably spend so much time at the high school level talking about relationships, but tell me something that you feel so important. Well, I, I mean, number one, any relationship, whether it's a peer relationship, whether it's romantic relationship, work relationship, it's communication. So if the other person doesn't know how you feel, then they're, you know, it, it changes their behavior. And if you don't know how they feel, it changes your behavior. Being able to communicate is so incredibly important. And, and the thing that I would say is, again, looking at how can, a, as a parent, how can you better impact your, your, your child in the future, it'd be recognizing the fact that your relationship with your child is one of their cornerstone relationships. So if you don't have a positive relationship with them, it makes it so difficult for them to have positive relationships with other people. Because again, they're gonna model you and they're gonna model y'all's relationship. So setting, being a really good role model. Um, and I know when conflict arises, no matter how old the kid is, helping um, talk the kid through the, whatever conflict they're having with their peers, and then role playing those same situations. Oops, I do that a lot with my kids. It's just, okay, you know, what did you say? What should you have said? What could they have said to make you feel better? Just going over and really examining those situations so they feel more comfortable next time that they occur. Mm -hmm. For sure. All right. Um, well, one thing I'd encourage is that, you know, just let you know at schools, particularly in the high school, because relationships are uh, such a big deal there that's part of the curriculum in that those advisory classes and they use um loveisrespect.org a lot is a resource particularly when you're talking not just about that yeah you know, it might focus a little more on dating relationships but to me it's just as important to talk about how we treat people we care in general with you know respect for sure. When I think of this, I again, I put that plug in for DI or other things that build that make them be with people. So again, if even if your child, we always go to sports, 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 you know, get your kid on that soccer team or get, you know, those are all great, but there's so much more out there um, to organizations, Boy Scouts, um, as you, they get older, yeah, absolutely harder. To, to have them buy in to some of these things, but there are some, um, you know, I have to dig a little deeper to get your kiddo into a group, but. Well, are but also too, there, I, I haven't come across a kid that doesn't have some interest, right? Mm -hmm. Now you might not always want the, your kid to have that interest, 
whether it's you know playing video games or or whatever there's other people there's at every school there's lots of people that want to do that same thing so just kind of giving them the freedom to build those relationships with those people is is really powerful for them and it and it helps them feel helps them not feel alone which is really important yeah absolutely and then also I apologize if I interrupted. So, Brian, I also feel it's so important to to take off the table, take popularity off the table. Right? I mean, it's just don't have that. that uh, what? What? I was like, what is that anyway? What does that mean? <laughs> yeah, if we have just a couple or a small group of friends, we 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 can take that to the bank for sure. Um, and so that would be is what I would key on with my kiddo uh, my my child is just hey who who could it possibly be that one or two friends now you know a little bit you know don't put all your eggs in one basket kind of a thing definitely maybe a smaller group not just one or two but that would be something to let them know that that is healthy it, it's not about popularity it's about having a few friends so with that thought though um i just wanted you know, so much of the time kids particularly but even as adults you have to admit we're waiting for someone to approach us and so I think it's really important for to give them the courage and the confidence to go and approach that other person they might see sitting alone or not talking to anybody in that biology class or whatever or at recess whatever your child's age well, and this, this year has been even more difficult just because of the seating arrangements at lunch I don't know, mm -hmm. the beginning of each semester this year, uh, being in the counseling office was exhausting because you'd have like 10, 15 kids every lunch come in right after another. I don't have anyone to sit with. Can I sit in this conference room all by myself? They're like, dude, like, no. So I would make tables and start helping them be like, go over there. They're looking for friends too. And oh, they're still sitting at the same table. They're, they've made new friends. And sometimes they just need that little encouragement because it is intimidating to go up to strangers, especially yeah. when they're young. Absolutely. Well, I want to honor people's time and we just have two more slides. So the last one we'll just kind of maybe not spend as much time on because again, we, we want to, we know it's late. Um, is just the last pedal is personal well being. That whole, yeah, I'm good. You're kind of like, hey, life's, you know, that feeling of, hey, life's at a good point. Um, and so there would be these um, type of things. So, you know, that you'll want to work on on these bullet points. I, a huge thing that's sticking out to me, particularly working with kids of all ages, I'm talking from, I work from preschool all the way up to high school, is our kids are not getting enough sleep. And you'll see that healthy living choices is a big part of personal well-being. And I know that if, if, if I, mama didn't get enough sleep, it's just, you know, I'm old enough and mature enough now to know I need to get to bed versus watch that other episode of whatever. But our kids are not. And so it's, it's tough, particularly as they get way older. So, you know, my teenagers, they do. They live the consequences. I tell them, I encourage them to get that eight hours of sleep. And so, but I'm not getting up at 10 or 11 or whatever and go in and check in on them to see if they're asleep. They have to live those consequences. But the um, that's just kind of throughout there as far as some living healthy choices, making healthy choices. And the other thing that strikes me on this list is the personal boundaries. And as young as, hey, you know, your body is yours, but also your emotions are yours. And so it's a it's not okay to say hurtful things, but it's also, you don't have to put up with people telling you a lot of hurtful things and knowing how to handle those situations. So I think that's something that probably is neglected somewhat of teaching kiddos really um, boundaries. I know at least I probably needed to have grown on that as a parent. Do you have any thoughts on this one? This is another one that really intermingles with the relationship pedal right like b having personal boundaries takes a lot of courage and sometimes the kids need encouragement to set them and they need help identifying when someone else is encroaching on their emotional boundaries physical boundaries is pretty simple you know someone hit me i didn't like it 
they cross my boundary. But, you know, having a best friend who is, you know, maybe talking behind your back, saying bad things about you to other people, or trying to get you to do something you're not comfortable doing, it's really hard for, for kids to really recognize it. And so it, it takes a while before they understand that it's, it is a problem. So just being supportive in those situations can be helpful as a parent and helping them recognize it, but you can't tell them it's weird. They have to pick it up on their own. Uh, and sure. you know, again, so much of this too is just modeling, model you know, self-care, model um, the right way to manage stress. You know, if you go home and drink, you know, six beers every night because you had a stressful day at work, that's what your kid, that's how your kids are going to, you know, handle their stress. And so, you know, just we, be, be careful. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so we definitely had said at the beginning, it was way too much to possibly, you know, get too much into specifics, but we do hope you have gotten something to take away of what you can do to just, again, applaud yourself for the ways that you're helping your kids with their social emotional health, but then um, challenge them in some areas. So the very last slide we'll go with um, is just, if, I don't know if you want to screenshot this, but just a few basic things. We've kind of covered it in general along the way. Um, I'd love to highlight of um, just finding a way to make sure that your child does feel safe to explore these topics with you and not safe, I mean, just in the safe that you're so open to it and approachable and um, giving them like, you know, that they know it's okay to talk to you about all these things. So. Um, I love when we think about, you know, everyone needs a sense of purpose. So on the fourth one there of just communicating to your child that they're valued and that they make a contribution to your home and ultimately the world, because there's just, that's definitely something that kiddos are like, why even bother? You know, they kind of can get pretty pessimistic in their thinking, but if we're there saying, no, but you do make a difference and we need you, um, in one way or another, it's it's very powerful. Mm -hmm. um, Brian, I'm going to put just a few resources here. It does have our emails, and so um, you know, a couple of good resources here from the district. Just the nisdtx.org/pe is parent education, and that's where we post all sorts of webinars. And you can see the upcoming ones, but you also can go back to the recorded ones. And we have some specifically on you know how to teach our kids you know empathy and how to care for others. So there's a wealth of um, resources there. And of course, healthychildren.org is just from in general most pediatricians would refer to that. Well, Very Well Mind is great for mental health. And then on the district's website, the counseling page, there's the Real Talks, and it helps explain all, it has lots of resources there for parents and a lot of the topics we talked about. But feel free to reach out to myself for sure, and um, I'm happy to walk through, you know, some of your concerns and just look at what that might look like to just make some growth in those areas. Ryan, do you have any last minute thoughts? And just the, you know, thank you all for, for coming and, you know, any, as far as I know, any parent who's signing onto a Zoom late at night to hear this type of stuff is really involved. And so we really appreciate mm -hmm. that. And I know that your kids do too. Um, and yeah, anything we can ever help y'all with, you know, feel free to reach out. Um, always happy to talk and always happy to help. So, yeah. And so it is right at eight o'clock. Is there any, uh, we'll stay on here for any questions. Um, otherwise, we again appreciate your time and look forward to helping you jump on some other webinars. So otherwise y'all are free to go and we'll just look at uh, any other questions someone might have. And yep, I just, I've got someone to contact already. So have a good night guys. Um,